This is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up, a special episode, Breaking Down Blockchain, with Don Tapscott, co-author of Blockchain Revolution, the CEOs of Hive Blockchain Technologies and Leonovis, and contributor for Brees Taylor on how to identify blockchain winners. If there's one emerging technology on the tip of everyone's tongues, it's blockchain. The digital ledger technology promises to completely upend the way we process commercial transactions and to keep our money safe from hackers. Blockchain has taken the investment world by storm, but few people truly understand what blockchain is and how it works. Here's what it's all about. A blockchain is a digitized ledger of all cryptocurrency transactions. Think of it like a traditional ledger book. It is made up of a series of blocks or files in which transaction data are permanently stored. Think of blocks as pages in the ledger book. An army of Bitcoin miners or bookkeeper compete to record new transactions and finish the latest block. Whichever miner finishes the latest block receives newly minted Bitcoin and transaction fees as a form of payment for their services. Once a block is completed, it's added to the blockchain. Now here is the genius of the technology. Each newly completed block is linked to the previous one with a reference number and encrypted so it can't be altered, copied, or deleted. Every Bitcoin miner connected to the blockchain network automatically receives an updated record of the chain. This encryption and decentralization means hackers cannot break into a single server and steal or destroy that transactional data, as they could in a bank vault, for instance. When it comes to understanding how blockchain is transforming our world and how to profit from it, one person stands out, and that's Don Tapscott. He's a technology evangelist and best-selling author who understood the power of the internet years before it became a crucial part of our economy. Tapscott thinks that blockchain can have a similar impact in digital commerce, and he's written a book about it along with his son Alex called Blockchain Revolution. Here's my chat with Don and how investors can capitalize on this transformation. Don, you've said that blockchain could be as significant to the world as the internet has been. Why do you say that? Well, actually, we view it as the second era of the internet. For 40 years, we've had the first era, an internet of information. But when I send you information, PDF, PowerPoint, email, I'm actually sending you a copy. And that works great for information, but when it comes to things that really matter to the economy, like assets, stocks, bonds, money, intellectual property, votes, carbon credits, our identities, copying those is a terrible idea. You don't want someone copying your identity, your vote, or your money. So uh, the way that we handle this in society is through big intermediaries that perform all the transaction and business logic of every type of commerce. They clear and settle transactions, they keep records, and, and uh, there are growing problems. So enter blockchain. For the first time ever, we not only have an internet of information, we now have an internet of value. Where anything of value from money to votes to music can be stored, managed, transacted in a secure and private way. And trust is not achieved by a big intermediary, it's achieved by cryptography and by some clever code. So that's why um, Alex, my son Alex and I call it the trust protocol. Trust is native to the medium. Now in your book, Blockchain Revolution, in your TED Talk and in your speeches, you cite five real world examples as to how blockchain can change the world. And one of them, well, they're all interesting, but the one that uh, is very visual, I think, is uh, when it comes to remittance, uh, where people are sending money back to their home countries. Explain that. Well, this is the biggest flow of money from the developed world to the developing world. It's upwards of a trillion dollars, more than foreign aid. And um, right now, well, I'll give you an example. In Toronto is a housekeeper named Annalie Domingo. And for 22 years, she gets on the bus, cashes her check, gets on the bus, and the subway and the bus, goes to the Filipino mall where the Western Union spe uh, specializes in the Filipino diaspora. And this is, people have left their ancestral lands, they send money back home. It took her four to seven days for the money to get there, and she got charged on the average of 10%. So over a year ago, Anna Lee, using a blockchain-based tool, sent money directly from her mobile to her mom's, with no intermediary. And when it arrived on her mom's, and was instant, and uh, her mom sees a bunch of tellers driving around, like Uber. And there's one that's 
seven minutes away. He's five stars, clicks on him, guy shows up at her door, gives her Filipino peso, she sticks him in her pocket. The whole thing is 1.5%. So that would be one of actually hundreds of examples that we're working on right now in, in the Blockchain Research Institute. So that's an example of the financial services industry being disrupted. We also know that major banks are working on blockchain platforms, but I'm curious, are they truly engaging it or do they, do they fear blockchain and do they see it as a threat? Well, they're different levels. A lot of them view it as a threat. Uh, JP Diamond said Bitcoin is a fraud, a fraud right. last week. Reminds me of Ken Olson. Why would anyone want a PC in their house? Remember from <laughs> Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, and then you see uh, at a higher level, there are the banks and executives that view this as an opportunity to cut costs. And there sure are opportunities. I mean, you tap your card in a Starbucks and, and a bunch of messages go through six companies using ancient technology, each with a counterparty risk and a cost, and three days later it goes back and a settlement occurs. Well, with a blockchain, the payment and the settlement would be the same activity. It's just a change in the ledger. So the, a lot of smart banks are thinking, whoa, that's an opportunity to cut some costs. But the real smart ones are not looking at it like any of that. They're looking at it strategically. How could a whole new internet of value enable us to create completely new products and services for customers to enter into whole new markets, to attack uh, new forms of competition that are coming from these new ways uh, in very powerful, uh, in, a, in a very powerful fashion. Now, Don, uh, Bitcoin is the most well-known, most popular cryptocurrency. It's at an all-time high recently, mm -hmm. but is there a bit of a mania building up around Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and blockchain? And if so, does it concern you? And what are the risks? Yeah, this is 1994 and there was a lot of hype and mania in 1994. And sure enough, you know, six years later, there was a correction that occurred when the dot-coms crashed. But don't confuse excitement and even hyperbole with, uh, the fact, with, with what some people say, that this is just a bubble, it's tulips in Holland. You know, it's not. This is the biggest innovation in computer science in our generation. And and we're in the very early days of this. Sure, there'll be volatility, as there has with Bitcoin, they'll be up and down and so on. But the arc of this whole thing is to go up for decades. Now, in terms of uh, blockchain companies and uh, the various sectors that are being influenced, uh, what are the most logical models and, and sectors that, that will be successful? Who will be the winners and losers? Or, or is it too early to tell that? Well, in every industry, and at the uh, Blockchain Research Institute, we're looking at 10 of them. Um, there are companies that are moving quickly into this space and benefiting, and the, there are the laggards. And, and um, so in financial services, it's very uneven. Uh, the Canadian banks are actually pretty good um, in using this technology, and, and you'll see lots more exciting things coming from them. But, you know, you look at something like uh, electronics manufacturing. Um, the, the biggest company in the world is Foxconn. They make your mobile device, whatever it is, and they make your computer and so on. They're moving to a blockchain for their supply chain. And then you look at health. You've got more working major health networks that are building a patient identity on a blockchain that before you you leave the hospital after a radiology report, your x-rays in your record and you own it. So uh, marketing, retail, uh, every energy and resources. Um, uh, Barrett Gold is one of the members of our research and there are really extraordinary things that are happening in, in the resource industry using blockchain. So it's, it's too early to tell, but as with the internet in the first era, there will be not only winners and losers, whole industries will be completely transformed by this, I believe. If you want to get a sense how giddy investors have become about the potential for blockchain, look no further than this chart. It was put together by CB Insights, which has been tracking since 2012 Bitcoin and blockchain technology investments. Back in 2012, virtually no money put into those two sectors. But fast forward four years, you're looking at 1.5 billion in total and the deals are getting bigger and the amount of deals getting bigger as well. $550 million in 2016 across 132 deals.
Blockchain may be a cutting edge digital technology, but it's underpinned by one of the world's oldest activities, and that's mining. The blockchain ecosystem relies on so-called Bitcoin miners who process transaction data in return for cryptocurrency. Also like traditional mining, Bitcoin mining takes a lot of heavy lifting and expensive equipment, in this case, computing power. Bitcoin miners need to solve a complex mathematical problem in order to win the reward for adding a block into the blockchain. Whoever solves the problem first earns the spoils. That set off a computational arms race in the industry in which ever stronger computers are needed to win those block fees. That means expensive upfront costs, electricity bills, and warehouse rentals. Hive Blockchain Technologies is aiming to become the biggest Bitcoin miner of them all. The company owns a cryptocurrency mining facility in Iceland and it operates around the clock. It also has options to buy four more. Hive CEO Harry Pochran explains why Bitcoin mining is so lucrative. Harry, is it an advantage that Hive is first out of the gate as a public company offering investors uh, exposure to both blockchain and cryptocurrencies? I, I think absolutely it is. Uh, I think we're <clears throat> lucky enough to be the first out the gate. I think that there's there's not really many ways for, for investors to to get exposure to to the crypto world. I think we're, we're somewhat unique because uh, we are on the mining end of it. Um, and I think that uh, over time, the mining, mining crypto, I think mining blockchain will also at some point become quite, quite a large portion of the market uh, that we can chase after as well. So you have two facilities uh, in very cold Iceland, and, and that's an advantage. You can tell us about that. But also you have options to buy three more from Genesis Mining. You have $32 million in cash. So should we, should we assume that at a steady pace you're going to buy those facilities? <laughs> We're... Yeah, we're not getting paid to sit on the cash, so yeah, we'll be we'll be deploying that as as quickly as we can, and 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 the intent and, and the business plan is to grow capacity as as quickly as we can. Um, Iceland, the reason Iceland's a great place, power is a big, uh, <clears throat> the cost of power is is a big part of uh, the input for for mining. Uh, it's well over fifty percent of our our input costs, so having geothermal and, and hydro is important. Also, it generates a lot of heat, so being in a cold climate uh, saves on your HVAC uh, costs as well. So certainly any, any sort of cold climate uh, with uh, low, cost, low cost power is a good jurisdiction to be in. Am I right in saying that uh, as blockchain becomes more prevalent and as cryptocurrencies become more popular and prevalent, that computational power needs to expand exponentially. So for you, is that, is that a, a challenge or an opportunity? It's, I guess, both. Um, it is, uh, you know, as, as the prices go up, it attracts more miners and, and you continually have to upgrade your equipment, you continue to have to add capacity. You're competing with these other, other miners, so as other miners come, come into the market, your margins compress. Um, there tends to be a bit of a lag between the crypto running and, and the network hash rate uh, catching up. So there are some, some times when, when you know, the margins are, are, are fabulous and then, and then <clears throat> they tend to get, get compressed as, as, the, uh, as the other miners come into, into the market. And just quickly, define hash rate because that's the term that's come out of the blockchain world that not everybody might yeah, hash know. rate is a, is a is a measurement of the computational power uh, that's dedicated towards mining and uh, is hive agnostic as to which cryptocurrencies you mine we our facilities at the moment are are GPU based miners so we would tend not to mine Bitcoin but rather all the alternative currencies so ethereum would be the main one uh, ethereum there's Zcash, there's a whole, quite a number of them, and we can switch, switch currencies depending upon the margins on the individual ones, or whether we're taking a view on a particular currency and we want to, to add that currency for, for some future event or something like that. Now, this is a, uh, an investment show, as you know, Harry. Our viewers love to know the numbers, but I understand that with your company, it's, it's such early days that it's difficult to get a handle on, on revenue and earnings projections. Why is that? 
<laughs> again, the margins are as, as volatile as the currency is, so that, that's one problem. It, it also, we will be hoarding coins, so we, have a growing, we will have a growing inventory of, of, of cryptocurrencies. And <clears throat> while it's, we just started mining um, beginning of September, uh, that inventory isn't meaningful at the moment, but it'll grow over time. So as, as time goes on, that part of our business uh, becomes more and more relevant. Your stock, and I don't need to tell you this, just exploded out of the gate when you went public in September. Is it almost kind of surreal? Or did, did it stun you, the, the, the move on the stock? Sure. Yeah, it, uh, the attention we've gotten is is amazing. When we started uh, looking at this, at, at doing this transaction originally, it was back in March or May, and and you know I guess in terms of the crypto world, that it's like a decade ago. So, so yeah, it 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 is it is it's quite something the the attention we've gotten. But you, you just look at the chart of the of the crypto since since the time when we started uh, uh, looking at, at doing this transaction. It's been it's 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 amazing. There's another important similarity between Bitcoin mining and traditional mining, and that's supply and demand. Every four years, the Bitcoin reward per block is halved in order to keep new supply in check. The reward started at 50 new Bitcoin per block in 2009, but fell to 25 Bitcoin in 2014. In 2018, it will fall again to 12.5 Bitcoin and so on. That means there are diminishing returns for mining Bitcoin and before long, it will become a game of scale. Blockchain is undoubtedly one of the most exciting investment opportunities right now, but when there are opportunities, there's also danger. All sorts of fraudsters have popped up with bogus investment scams trying to capitalize on blockchain mania. So how do investors avoid getting drawn into a scam? Contributor Fabrice Taylor is here now to tell you what to look for. Fabrice, there's so much hype, so much talk about blockchain. It's been said there's a real revolution going on here. What's the investment case for blockchain? Right. Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. It's the most promoted thing right now, which means that uh, you know it's real, but there's a lot of fluff around it. There's a lot of you know misinformation around it. And every promoter that I know is running around trying to figure out how to put together a shell, stick in something they can call blockchain or, or, or Bitcoin, and make a bunch of money in a very short period of time. You don't want to be buying their stocks, obviously. You have to understand what blockchain is. So let's start with that. At the end of the day, it's just kind of like a way of keeping your books. It's a ledger technology, okay? It's just that it's decentralized. So you take your ledger, your accounting, your books, you send them off into little packets to a bunch of different storage areas, and you've got a decentralized system that can't be changed, it can't be hacked, it can't be altered in any way, and let, because you just can't, no hacker can get at it, it's just it's stored in too many places. That in and of itself is nothing particularly interesting. Uh, it's the advent of powerful computing, like everything in technology is. And I liken it a little bit to the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet was invented, what, probably the late 70s, maybe the early 80s. I think the first company that put one out was Lotus, and you had to be a little older to remember Lotus Notes, but that's who did it. Um, but the spreadsheet revolutionized everything, right? Revolutionized finance, revolutionized physics, because suddenly you could use a computer and do millions of calculations and probabilities and permutations in a fraction of a second. And that is why the derivatives market exploded. That's why, I mean, even the, the Dreamliner wouldn't exist without spreadsheets because they need to do so many calculations when they design airplanes. Now, nobody really got rich off uh, the spreadsheet uh, in the long term because it became a commodity. You can get a free spreadsheet now that's as powerful as, or more powerful than the original ones. Still, in the early days, there will be the Lotus Notes. Okay, these are blockchain companies that will have real software real coding abilities and a real business plan and what you want to look for there is people who have an application they can tell you we're doing blockchain for this specific purpose and here's how we we're going to sell it and here's our potential clients and here's the problem we solve if you can't answer that you don't want to be anywhere near it so compared to other booms uh, in various sectors in your time in the market let's say technology the late 90s let's say cannabis where are we with, with blockchain? Are we reaching a point of saturation and borderline mania or, or not really? Is it still early days? 
Well, we're full into the beginnings of the mania. If you look at a company called Hive, it went public a month ago, I think at 30 cents. I own some stock and it's now, it hit $2. It's got a market cap of $400 million and they bought an asset for 9 million, which is the core asset in there. So you take 9 million, turn it into 400 million, that's a good trade. Uh, they were smart, they raised a bunch of money at $1.50. Now they've got the cash to go out and add to what they've got. Smart guys. Um, there are other examples out there of really low-end, low-rent, low-grade promoters who are slapping the word blockchain. If you read carefully, we are exploring blockchain opportunities. Their stocks go up anyway. You've got to be careful. These guys aren't going to take you anywhere. So we're at the early stages of the mania. Some people will survive. Some people will not. Most, most of the stocks, I would say 1 in 20, are quality. The rest are garbage. You've got to be really careful. And we're going to be publishing a running tally of these things because blockchain in itself it's hard to understand for the average guy like you and me. We're not technologists, we don't really understand it. So you're better off doing due diligence on who's behind the deal and that's what we're going to do. We're going to tell you here's the people behind the deal and here's their last five deals. Tell You judge for yourself if you want to be involved in this one. Every pump and dumper out there is, is putting together a blockchain deal right now and that's too bad because if you know we could focus where the capital goes and it goes to the more promising uh, players. Uh, I talked to you about Leonovus. Uh, that's a very interesting company. They've been at it for seven years. They've invested $25 million. They're real and they've got a shot. But even that one is going to be risky, okay? But they've got a shot. A lot of these other ones, they don't have a chance in hell of making it, but the promoters will always make money. You don't want to be buying stock from them. That's the number one rule. There's no shortage of scams using the promise of Bitcoin and blockchain to reel in unsuspecting investors. Here are three of the main ones to avoid. The first one is Bitcoin Ponzi schemes, which promise high interest rates on deposits, but collapse once new investors stop signing up. The second, Bitcoin mining scams, which promise investors their money will be used to buy Bitcoin mining computers that are never delivered. And third, Bitcoin phishing scams, which use malicious links embedded in emails to steal login information for Bitcoin accounts. There are a few golden rules to keep in mind when assessing Bitcoin and blockchain investments. Number one, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Number two, always use a broker or platform that you trust. And number three, never trust unsolicited offerings. Blockchain may have been designed with transaction processing in mind, but it's hardly its only application. In fact, in the future, security is where blockchain may be the most widely used. Let's take the case of Yahoo's data breach as an example. Recently, Yahoo disclosed that all three billion of its accounts were affected by a hack in 2013. It stands as the largest data breach ever and by a long shot. It's larger than the next eight biggest data breaches combined. That's according to consultancy Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. The problem, Yahoo kept its client data in one place, meaning hackers only had to break the company's initial line of cyber defense to steal all of that information. Leonovus is looking to use blockchain technology as a hack-proof second line of defense. What it does is it encrypts its clients' sensitive data breaks it up into millions of pieces and spreads it out across all sorts of servers. That way, if a hacker finds some data, they probably don't know what they have and they won't be able to alter it anyway. The CEO, Michael Gaffney, explains how it all works. Michael, Leonovus has been in distributed storage for a long time, about a decade now. Mm -hmm. You've, You've got, got a bunch of patents. Um, blockchain is hot, as we know, and as we were talking about before uh, we started this interview. Explain what your technology is in, in, a, in, in layman's terms so we can all understand it. So the easiest way to understand it, Mark, is that if this is your data, we take your data, we put it into our digital blender, if you will, and we, we slice it up, we dice it up, we bleach it, we add some stuff to it, and we make basically a digital smoothie. And we take that, that, that data, which is now a digital smoothie, and we disperse it across numerous storage nodes throughout your organization. It can be inside the organization or it can be outside the organization. What I mean by that is you could use all the servers you have inside as well as maybe cloud services like from Amazon or Bell or Rogers, any number of things. Um, and if somebody steals one of those nodes, they get just basically a digital smoothie. You get nothing. Now, you've designed your system on the assumption that current security networks and systems don't work. Why'd you do it that way? 
Uh, we felt that the uh, issues of ransomware and data theft were, were only increasing. Therefore, if we're going to build a technology, let's build it with the assumption that physical and network and, and, and security does not work. And if we can build something, when we talk to somebody and say, all that investment we've assumed doesn't work, it doesn't mean don't do it, of course, but we've really got something if we can tell it and actually deliver a product that, that, that it makes that assumption. And now you're tacking blockchain onto your technology. Why is that so important in, in data storage? And, and tell us about uh, uh, the actual act of, of tacking it on and selling it to customers. Blockchain's promise, not only in cryptocurrency, but in smart contracts, will make it very easy for a customer to go and validate that a, that a service provider, like Leonovus, is actually delivering what they said they were going to deliver, because they can go check the smart contracts. In addition to that, we can take uh, complex pieces of, of, of applications, if you will, put them inside a blockchain and make the application itself even more secure. Investors are watching this, they're thinking, okay, that's interesting. Where are you in terms of revenue and, and profitability? You're just starting in that phase, because this is basically a turnaround. It is a turnaround. The company's had over $20 million invested in it. We've got 45 patents or patent uh, filings. Uh, the customer pipeline just started in August. I took the company over last November. Uh, we expect to close one new customer a month. The sales cycle for large enterprise customers is about six to nine months. We believe that the customers we're putting in the pipeline right now will be eventually in the one to two million dollar revenue range annually. Of course, we'll grow that. It'll take a year to grow it up to that. And uh, is it too early to, to make projections into 18, 19, 2020 in terms of what, what the revenue looks like and so, profitability? I'll give you the model, okay. is that where each salesperson is, ta is, is tasked with finding a new, a new customer a month. I just mentioned that re average revenue, call it a million dollars. So over a period of two years, that, that salesperson might find 20, uh, will find hopefully 24 customers. That's worth $24 million. And we're in the process of adding you know, four or five salespeople to the team. So it is my goal, no guarantees, let's be honest, but it is my goal to build a $100 million plus revenue company in three years. And uh, give us the investment case here. You, you have been uh, to a degree. Sum it up for us. Why should investors be interested in, in Leonovus? So currently we're trading at about uh, two times uh, invested capital. By the end of this year, we'll have about $25 million invested. The current market cap of the company is around $40 million. So that's a very, still a very attractive uh, um, uh, investment opportunity. And uh, you know, if we truly are delivering on this $100 million revenue path, I think a lot of investors know exactly what kind of multiples a $100 million software company is worth. So there's still lots of upside for investors. And lastly, Michael, is there one thing we haven't talked about you'd like to get across? I think there's a whole bunch of follow-on technologies, Mark, that make, will make the offering even more exciting and more differentiated in the future. For example, we have a, compu a distributed compute solution that is quite interesting. Uh, for people who have looked at the ICO, that's the initial coin offering market, I suggest they look at a company called Filecoin and then look at Leonovus. We have exactly what uh, Filecoin says they're going to build, which will take them two years to build. We have it right now, and they raised almost $250 million in two days. The myriad applications for blockchain technology has analysts predicting big things for the market's growth in the coming years. In December of last year, consultancy firm Grandview Research estimated the global blockchain technology market was worth about half a billion US dollars in 2015. By 2024, it sees the market soaring to $7.7 .7 billion. That would be a 15-fold increase in just nine years. Grandview Research says blockchain will be used not just in the financial services industry, but also in consumer and industrial goods, healthcare and transportation, just to name a few. From the heart of the Financial District in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.